For Krumah Media's policy, I'm Sashni Madi. Sociology professor and author Roger Southall unpacks his book, Whites and Democracy in South Africa. Your book focuses on how white South Africans have adapted to the arrival of democracy and political change in South Africa. As such, it is open to a certain amount of controversy or, as you write, contempt. Why then do you think it is important to have this conversation 28 years into democracy? Well, I think we need to engage clearly with the whole issue of um, relationship between different communities in our country. And at the moment, a lot of the discourse in the media uh, is highly polarised. And um, I think that's people perhaps reacting to sort of exchanges which go on in social media, which are often not terribly helpful, I think, in necessarily determining inverted commas, what one call reality. So I think it's important to drill down a little bit and to study the reactions of the white community, which I can, if I can remind you, is the is the one white minority in the world, maybe apart from Namibia, which is, you might say, is a little bit of an extension of South Africa in this context. It's the only white minority in the world which is ruled by a black majority. So therefore, in that way, we are unique. And so I think it, uh, it pays to explore how this white minority, which we know was a, obviously there are exceptions, but was a brutal and arrogant ruling minority previously, how they have adapted to the new settlement, which was forged in 1994 and 1996. Um, and it's been varied. But um, I, open, I admit I open myself up to controversy because my ultimate conclusion is that with a lot of ifs and buts, all things considered, we haven't done too badly. Now, black empowerment and employment equity are seen as tools for racial redress in a highly divided and unequal society. But many argue that the patterns of colonialism and apartheid are not really changing. What do you think South Africa is getting wrong? In the book, I, I, I use focus groups to look at uh, white attitudes, uh, focus groups conducted around the country. Um, and there was various encouraging things. And some of these things were saying that basically white South Africans, they recognise a lot of the sins of the past. They recognise that apartheid was uh, brutal. On the whole, they do not want to go back to apartheid. But then on the other side, there are things which they get quite upset about, and equity employment was very much one which they felt was unfair. Now, they are arguing, they, the, the respondents tended to argue, the majority of them tended to argue, that, look, we, we've worked hard, uh, you know, we've, we've, done, we've got qualifications, we have a lot to offer, um, and that uh, effectively that we are being discriminated now uh, under this legislation. So I think that is perhaps the issue which concerns the white respondents the most. And of course, I think it's going to continue to be controversial because we are in a situation where we know we have massive black unemployment and we have a, a thrusting upwardly black middle class, which wants its place in the sun and feels its way is blocked by whites. I think perhaps what we've got to do is to try and get away from thinking about the employment situation um, at the middle and top levels where whites are the most competitive. I think probably for everyone's good, we've got to stop regarding it as a zero sum situation. And I think that there is need for much more dialogue and consensus around this than we've got at the moment. But I don't think the resentment of whites is going to go away about that. That may be incorrect. I think maybe they uh, fail to interpret the urgency of the need for change. On the other hand, I think that uh, there is probably need for recognition on the other side of the argument that, like it or not, for historical reasons which may be unfortunate, but nonetheless, the white population has a body of skills which this country can ill afford to throw away.
Now, your book does show that while some white South Africans are reluctant Democrats, they have accepted democracy. Just tell us a bit more about this finding. Well, we all know that the uh, the actual democratic transition was very troubled. Um, that uh, the National Party in particular lost the support, particularly of its previous support base amongst Afrikaners, who from 1992 essentially migrated to the then Conservative Party. Um, and that in the last white election, the National Party was actually uh, backed more by English-speaking South Africans than Afrikaners. So a lot of the Afrikaner community, not exclusively Afrikaners, but it was largely resistance to the new constitution and the democratic settlement was largely, largely an Afrikaner issue, and it tended to migrate to the political right. Now, ultimately, that threat was defeated. It was defeated by the farce in Baputatswana, where you remember there was uh, attempt by white militia forces to prevent Mangopi from being destabilised. But that was defeated in part through the lack of discipline of the white forces themselves and the AWP. But at the end of the day, what you've got a situation is that the while the white population has a very considerable res reserve of economic power, it has lost military power now, and it has had no alternative but to accept the situation. And therefore, it needs to find accommodations. And I think I'm glad to say that although the way in which whites are responding to the new democratic settlement varies, there is increasingly an agreement to engage with the institutions of our democracy. For instance, via the Solidarity Organization and AFRI Forum. A lot of people don't like what they do, which is fair enough. Uh, you may argue that Solidarity and African Forum actually essentially are guarding white interests, protecting white interests, and particularly Africana interests. But the positive side of that is that they are engaging peacefully with state institutions. They are using the court system to fight their fight. Sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. But it's very important to realise that that is a, a major accommodation to our constitution. Again, while some white South Africans have accepted democracy, your book points out that not many support actions to rectify the consequences you know, of the racist past. Can you talk to us about how white privilege plays out in this context? White privilege, I think, continues to play out in a number of ways. Um, for a start, I think one white response is to effectively withdraw from the new situation. It may well be that whites go to the polls in higher proportions than the other communities in this country, which is positive. We need people to vote. It shows that they are at least engaging with the new democracy. On the other hand, uh, many of those self-same whites will effectively engage into white enclaves. Um, whether, via, whether physically in terms of gated communities and golf estates and what have you, or socially by essentially moving in exclusively white circles. So I think the tendency to withdraw continues to be quite pronounced, although I would add that it is a wider problem in our own society because the legacy of apartheid geography continues to be immense, and we are still stuck with overwhelmingly white Indian coloured communities. And these communities continue to interact primarily with themselves. Perhaps the meeting point is in the increasingly multiracial uh, middle class, where people meet together in the workplace, and on the whole, pretty, get on pretty well together. Uh, I think, of course, there are conflicts in any workplace. And in South Africa, inevitably, they often take racial overtones. But on the whole, I think we do pretty well at that. But once people go home, on the whole, and of course, there are some lovely exceptions, on the whole, people continue to mix in their own communities. But as a whiteness scholar said to me the other day, she said, you go down to the beach these days, and it's unrecognizable from 25 years ago. 
there are public spaces where there is mixing of races and there are no questions raised whatsoever. So I think we must also try to look at the good things that are going on in our society and get away from the negative stereotypes which were being fed in the media the whole time. While the Democratic Alliance preaches non-racialism, Black liberals continue to leave the party. How can the DA be a more effective opposition? It goes back, I think, a lot into history. I think the uh, my personal view is that the Democratic Alliance um, made considerable progress uh, around the year 2013 when Helen Ziller first became leader, but they seem to have lost traction after that. After the last election, of course, Musi Maimani was dumped rather unceremoniously. And I think the evidence is that although, and I think we must be fair here, although the DA has a significant contingent of uh, historically black um, councillors and members of the party, but nonetheless, it displays an alarming tendency to lose leading black figures. The accusation they make is usually that the DA has been running by a white cabal. And of course, the DA now has a white leader um, whose personal qualities we may or may not like. But we might say that the DA having a white leader does send the wrong signals out. The DA is caught up in a dilemma. It is beginning to lose its historically white supporters to the Freedom Front and is trying to retain its vote at the same time that it knows it's got to appeal more extensively to a black audience. It seems to be caught in the middle and not really resolving the issue um, at all. At the beginning of your book, you say that as a white author who was not born in South Africa, it was an uncomfortable book for you to write. Has it been a process of self-reflection writing this book? Yes, definitely. Um, I, I mean, I think that's why I was rather intrigued to write the book because I know perfectly well that uh, I've been here since 1989. I wanted to come I've been in, in Lesotho in the 70s. So I got, you know, involved in sort of sort of struggle as an academic. I wanted to come back and um, join colleagues I'd got to know basically on the left in academia. I wanted to be part of it. It was exciting. And I've got no regrets at coming back whatsoever. But you also know that when you're coming back and you're working in South African academia, you're getting paid, not badly at all. And you're living in white suburbia on the whole, most of us do, maybe many of us in multiracial areas, but nonetheless, we are in a position of relative privilege. Um, and I am not Mahatma Gandhi. I do not give all my worldly resources to the poor. And one continues to struggle with the massive extent of poverty in this country, massive inequality. And I do admit to feelings of unease about that. Um, and I think it's important that all of us, not only the, uh, those of us who are white, continue to realise that inequality in this country is grossly offensive and that we need to do uh, personal things to try to alleviate it. But of course, the issue is structural. Finally, and as your last chapter asks, do you believe there is still white in the South African rainbow? Maybe it's a little bit detached these days, but um, I'm always driven, ever since I've lived in South Africa, by this uh, phrase accredited to the Italian Marxist uh, Gramsci, you have to live by the optimism of the will. If you stop believing this in South Africa, then I think we've finished. We have to continue to, I think, hang on to the dream. It's looking pretty murky at the moment, but I think we have to continue to hang on to those ideals. If we, if we give them up, I think, then we're, then we're in big trouble. I think we, continue, we have to continue to live by the ideals of the constitution. That was sociology professor and author Roger Southall unpacking his book, Whites and Democracy in South Africa.